Hello, everybody, and welcome to SendCal Dreamin'. I want to thank Bitwise Industries for putting on this remarkable and incredible event every year. So we are so excited to be here. Good to see you all. I love seeing you in the chat. So please feel free to let me know where you are coming in from. We're excited to be with you today. Thank you for joining this event. We are going to be talking about a really exciting subject today. So I am ready for us to pull these slides up to the main stage so that we can get started so we can talk about this really exciting topic, user centered design. Here we go. This is going to be really, really a fun day. Uh, I know that you all are dialing in for such an incredible amount of things from an incredible amount of places. So thank you for deciding to come to the Sierra stage. Today, we're gonna to be talking about human-centered design for salesforce.com user adoption. I know if you're here, you already think that is a problem. Salesforce user adoption is a problem and why? Why is that? I'm gonna tell you why users hate Salesforce. You've heard it, you've seen it, Users will tell you, I hate Salesforce. Salesforce is hard. Salesforce is complicated. And they're telling you this everywhere. If you search online, if you type it into Google, you can see there are 3.9 million results. If you say, what is the biggest problem in Salesforce? Is it user adoption? If you go to Reddit, which is one of my favorite places to talk about Salesforce, and you will see that people are saying, I hate Salesforce. I don't like Salesforce. Salesforce is hated. Everybody hates their job because of Salesforce. And I see Melissa's putting in the chat that she has a broken heart. And I think most of us do because we're here because we love Salesforce, right? We are passionate about Salesforce. We are incredibly excited about Salesforce. We see it as a remarkable platform. And when our users tell us, oh, I don't like it, that offends us personally, but you can do something about it, right? You don't have to sit by and look at Twitter and you guys can see, these are all recent comments. I hate Salesforce, I hate Salesforce. Alex Newton says, you don't hate Salesforce, you're just not utilizing it to its full potential. And that is close to the answer. So if you can type in the chat for me what your Salesforce role is, if you're a technologist, an admin, a developer, a BA, a project manager, a user, a super user, let me know where you're coming from. Because if you're here today at SendCal Dreamin', you probably love Salesforce and it confounds you. Why? Why would somebody hate Salesforce? How could they tell me that? Salesforce can do anything, right? We can make it stretch to do everything we need it to. Well, a lot of times it's because we have magnificent, beautiful technology that doesn't meet our users' needs. How can we fix that? We're gonna talk about that today. All right, so for those of you that already know me, hello friends, I am so excited to see you here. And for those of you that don't, you're my friend now. <laughs> so my name's Shannon Gregg, I'm Dr. Salesforce. I have my PhD in community engagement and that long string of words was the title of my dissertation, which I completed last year. How diffusion of innovations, change management, and adult learner user adoption theories impact CRM adoption and usage. So I spent a lot of time first learning how to do really good research. So we had coursework on things like public policy and things like qualitative and quantitative research and understanding your research goals and how to work with human subjects. And then I had to do research on at least 100 peer reviewed pieces of academic writing that focused around these topics. Now, it may not surprise you to know, there's not a ton of academic writing out there on that specific topic that we all love, Salesforce user adoption. So instead, I had to go really deep on these theories to say, how does diffusion of innovations work in an organization? And that's as simple as saying, how does somebody learn about a new technology and start to use it? How do they spread that idea? And you guys know that piece intrinsically, right? Because you're so excited about Salesforce. When you make a change or you implement something new, you can't wait to tell your users about it and how to use it. And you've got some of those fabulous super users. We've got Abby in here who's a user that you can say, 
I know I'll trust you to spread the word, right? So that's what diffusion of innovations is. How do we get that information out there so that more people can learn about it and get that idea to spread, right? Do you remember the first time you ever rode in an Uber? I do. I was in San Francisco at Dreamforce when Uber launched and they were saying, here's a free Uber code. And we're all looking around each other thinking, I'm not going to get in a stranger's car. That seems crazy. Who just jumps in the car with a stranger? <laughs> and a lot of times when you're launching something new in Salesforce, your users are saying the same thing. That seems crazy. Why do you want me to use MFA? That seems like it's going to add so much work to my day. Well, that's how diffusion of innovations is important for you, for your users. Change management theory, a lot of you know about. We've got David in here, who's a user adoption specialist. We've got my friend Simon in here, who's got a whole entire company built around user adoption. And so when you think about change management, that's really critical for humans. Humans really need to understand why do we have to do this change? So how can they buy in? Where can we find out more information about this change? And then that adult learner theory. So how do different people learn? And you're all familiar with this. Some people are auditory learners. Those are my friends out there that love to listen to podcasts. Some are visual learners. Those are the, the ones of you that immediately started reading every single word on this slide as soon as I put it up. And some are kinesthetic learners. And those are the people who love to do UAT because making mistakes helps them to learn, right? And so when you combine those three together, it really helps you get down to how do we help people adopt Salesforce or any other technology platform a little bit better? But how do we take a few steps back and think about how to design this to be friendly for our humans that are going to be using it, right? Because I guarantee every single one of you that is listening right now is a beautiful, brilliant technologist. You understand what Salesforce does. You get it. You can build beautiful technology that says, tell me your process or tell me what you're doing that needs to be automated and I will make Salesforce do that piece for you, right? You're all beautiful technologists. But you know what we aren't? We aren't sitting in the seat of the service agent who's taking 10 calls per hour and trying to cycle them through under their SLAs or under their times that say, you have to resolve every call in six minutes. We aren't salespeople who are carrying a bag, who have a million dollar quota on our back every single quarter. And every minute that I spend trying to figure out Salesforce is one minute when I'm not doing revenue generated activities, right? We aren't those people, but we can get down to a place where we can think like those people and we can start to predict what they're going to need by doing just a little bit of human-centered focus, human-centered design to say, hey, guess what? I can make Salesforce so great for you that the discussion about adoption isn't even going to be necessary. You may have also heard human-centered design be referred to as design thinking. There are loads of theories about that. As technology becomes even more pervasive in our lives, we see more and more people who are saying, okay, but what about that end user? How can we make sure that the technology, this beautiful, gorgeous technology is built in a way that they want to use it? So today I'm going to introduce you to the concept of human-centered design as presented by Luma Institute, who is a fantastic shop that just exists to think about how do we make sure that what we're designing works for humans. They work with organizations all over the planet on things like nonprofit approaches, technology adoption. They even think about how we can improve supply chain management. So I'm going to introduce you to their theories of human-centered design. We're going to talk a little bit about recipes, how you can build one out, and then I'm going to give you two that you can put into use today as soon as SendCal Dreaming is over to start to get to what it is that your users really want and need. All right. First, let's talk a little bit about the Luma methods of human-centered design. You can see there are three columns here, and the first one is looking, the second one is understanding, and the third one is making. Inside every one of those columns, you've got some subheadings like ethnographic research, participatory research, evaluative research, and under those are the methods, okay? We're gonna go through these pretty quickly because there will be some that you may say, ah, oh, that's appealing, you know, that's something I wanna do. And you'll use these at different times and in different ways. So if you're doing a full scale implementation, you're going to do different discovery and capture different 
things from your users that will help you build out those user stories, right? So you're thinking as a user, as a sales user, I want to, and you're going to fill in that blank. But these are all methods that you can use to help fill those blanks in with a little bit more understanding, even if you're coming into an org that is unknown to you in an industry that is unfamiliar to you, right? So let's talk about these just for a few minutes. You might already use some of these when you're trying to facilitate new uh, approaches to your Salesforce design. If you're doing an integration, if you're changing fields, if you're changing names of fields, if you're building a custom object, all of those things can be helped by doing just a little bit of digging to say, what is it that my user wants and how can I get to that place, right? So in that first column looking, that deep research may be something you apply when you are looking at a brand new org. So if you're doing full scale implementation, you want to get super, super deep to say, okay, tell me about your process now. Because the process now may be, I take a phone call from a prospect, I write down the information, I stand up out of my cube and I run down the hall to see if we have what my prospect needs. Okay, so you're gonna do this type of research and you may do this in loads of different ways. You may do value stream mapping, you may use an ISO approach. At any rate, you're always doing this kind of discovery when you're trying to figure out what it is that your user needs. So that is, I would call that first column very deep and one that you wouldn't use very often. When you get into understanding, here's where the rubber starts to meet the road and this is where most of us probably spend most of our day. So when you're looking first at people and systems, systems. We're looking at stakeholder mapping. That one we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail today. Uh, they have persona profiles and you guys are really familiar with this if you've done user stories. So you'll say, you know, I've got a sales user, I've got a sales manager, I've got a service user, I've got a service manager, I have somebody in operations, supply chain, finance, HR. You understand what that persona profile is. Experience diagramming. So this is where you'll go in and say, you know, maybe I've got a team that's got a lot of people that are pretty new to using this type of platform. For us, it's amazing to think that somebody may be new to using CRM or technology to capture this information, but I know you see it. You see these people every day. And one of the things that, that experience diagramming helps you caution yourself against is the curse of knowledge. The curse of knowledge is once you know something, it's almost impossible to remember what it feels like to not know how to do that thing. You've got concept mapping, which I know a lot of you are doing every single day where you say, what are the concepts that we're trying to solve here? So if you're trying to add document automation, how do I do that? What's the concept here? What are the pains that I'm trying to overcome by adding this new beautiful piece of technology in? Um, when you look at patterns and priorities, affinity clustering, so you know, people in sales probably want the opportunity a uh, record to do this, people in service probably want different information from it. So you'll start to look at what people want based on their persona profiles. Uh, same with bullseye diagramming where you will say, okay, everybody wants a lot of things, but what are the things most people want the most of? You'll look at that importance difficulty matrix, which um, you know a lot of people know as that, is it critical, is it important, is it useful? And if it takes me 12 hours to customize that into Salesforce, but it's only solving a problem that we have once a year when we do financial reports, is it worth the investment? So when you're starting to think about those things, you'll see that. And visualizing the vote is just a good way for you to say, okay, if I've got executives that are looking forward to do this, but my daily users are going to find this, you know, it's going to be encumbering them for their job. How do I visualize what the vote's going to look like? So you can start to build out that adoption from there, right? So there's loads of different methods that you've got here in this Luma approach. But what I want to do is talk to you about how you can build a recipe, take the ones that make the most sense. And we're going to get a little bit deeper in the system usability scale and the stakeholder mapping. And at the end, we'll have just a little bit of time for questions. So if you have any while this is going on, please feel free to throw them in the chat as it occurs to you and we'll address them at the end. I'll also share with you the references from Luma, their book and their cards. So if you are really interested in them, you can get them. And I will also tell you how you can get a free copy of my book that I will mail directly to your house. Okay, how do you build a recipe? What's a recipe? So the methods that Luma has or any other human-centered design approach are amazing when they're on their own. 
But just like anything else, you have to think about the entire system, right? So I could build you a gorgeous custom object that says, here's how we are going to onboard customers. And I could build that in a vacuum and say, look at this beautiful piece of technology that I just added to our Salesforce instance. It's so nice. But if it doesn't address collecting information all the way back from marketing through to sales so I can hand it off to service, it's not doing a lot of good, right? And that's exactly how all of these specific methods in Luma work. You want to look at that sort of holistic approach to say, what makes the most sense? So a recipe is when you take two to five different methods and combine them to meet your particular objective. And again, if you're familiar with writing user stories, you already know how this sort of thing works. You start with a question, begin with the end in mind, just like Covey taught us. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? So we can then say, here's how we can get to the inputs to determine what that outcome is going to be, right? So you're going to select a few different methods to reach your, your specific objective. I'll tell you guys, this is exactly how a PhD dissertation works. You have a question that you want to answer and you say, what methods can I use to get to that? You do your deep research, you file your um, investi investigation objectives with your IRB at your university, and then you go out and actually interview your users in the way that makes the most sense. So this is exactly what that is. This is saying, how do we take this sort of academic approach to human-centered design and build technology that people are actually going to use, right? So here for this particular one, I'm saying our question is, how can I improve Salesforce user adoption by using human-centered design or design thinking? So I want to teach you about these two particular approaches that I think are beautiful for most of the instances that you're going to have whenever you are thinking about building something new in Salesforce. The first one is evaluative research, and we're going to get just a little bit deeper in that in a minute. And the second one is um, we're going to dig into stakeholder mapping. So we're going to go through those. And if you're the type of person that likes to take pictures of slides, the next few slides are the ones. And if you're the type of person that likes to take notes, now's the time. Get that little pencil ready. <laughs> Here we go. So we're going to talk about the system usability scale. On the left-hand side is a page from the book that I will share with you at the very end. That's the Luma approach. But um, as I, I've been trained in this approach, and so I'm going to tell you how it works, and you're already going to be familiar with the sort of philosophy behind it, okay? So let's talk about system usability. This is a survey that you can use to say, how can I quantify feedback? Because we want data, right? We want to be able to say, what's the data, not what's my gut feeling? What do I think my users want? But we want to use data to say, Let's look at what our users say so that we can get this feedback from our users. I will tell you in the Trailblazer community, there are some good approaches people have where they do survey their users a few times a year. And you can search that in the Trailblazer community and people have really particular questions that they ask. You might already be doing this. That's fantastic if you are. If you aren't, it's a great time to think about it. You know, do you do it? once a year to say, okay, how do you feel about these particular things? I'm gonna talk about this system usability scale, which is a particular one that is used pretty widely, but you can always add to that. So when you think about how people feel when they're using something, remember back on the first slide when I said, would it surprise you to know that many users hate Salesforce and Melissa had a broken heart about it? And I'm sure a lot of the rest of you did too. And when you go to meetings and somebody says, I can't stand Salesforce. You take it as a personal affront, right? What do you mean? Salesforce is amazing. It's incredible. It works beautifully. It's phenomenal. Well, we need to get a little bit deeper to find out what it is that the users are really trying to tell us. They're saying they don't like Salesforce, but it's because they're getting stuck on something, right? So John Brook, who worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, came up with a Likert scale. And you're all familiar with Likert scales because you get served them every time you purchase something where they tell you, tell me if you strongly agree or you strongly disagree, and you pick that radial button that makes the most sense for you. So John Brook designed this system usability scale that is a good generic way to collect information back to say, tell me how the system is working for you. Now, if you're doing a fresh clean implementation, let's say that the organization that you're working with 
is literally using paper. They're using Excel. They're not coming from another CRM that they're trying to move over and integrate into Salesforce. They're coming from a very rudimentary place. Maybe they're a small organization. Maybe they're, they're you know, not a tech forward organization, but they're coming from a place where they don't have technology already capturing the things that they want Salesforce to capture. You still can use the system usability scale because you're going to ask them about their current approach, right? Their current process, the way that it works out for them right now. And so when you're looking at the system usability scale, you can deploy it to your users to be able to say, 70% of you said this, or 60% of people in this particular role said this, and that's going to help you to understand, aha, my users are telling me, these are things that are critical to them. These are things that get in their way. These are the things that they're looking for. So that if somebody does have a million dollar quota per quarter and every single minute that they have to click around on 40 fields in Salesforce or re-enter information that was already on the lead object, on their lead record, that should be carrying over, that you know you can build good tech for, that will automatically port it to the opportunity, you're gonna get this information when you start to ask them about the system that they're currently using and the way it's designed. You can also use this when you're doing a technology audit. I recommend everybody does a technology audit at a certain amount of time. Once a year is a great way to do it, but making sure that you're going back and saying, what we built, does it still work for you? So you'll see here in the system usability scale, there are questions that are easy for people to answer. I think that I would like to use the system frequently. I thought the system was easy to use. I found the various functions in the system were well integrated. I think most people will be able to learn the system quickly. And then it starts to ask them things like, you know, are you confident in using the system? When you put these surveys out, you can ask them, and it doesn't have to be hi-fi. You don't have to create something really magnificent. You can use an easy survey approach to say, answer these questions so that I can collect the data. Don't give them too long to fill it out. If you give them too long, they won't do it. But ask them to make sure that they are spending the time on it so they aren't just answering from a place of recency, where yesterday they had a really tough time saving an opportunity because there were too many required fields and they're frustrated and they answer your, your survey in that way. So you want to make sure that they have the time to fill it out, but not too much time or else you won't get the good data that you need. You want to make sure that you are giving them these questions so that they can respond to you and let you know, here's what's frustrating. Do you want a free text field to collect free text? Well, <laughs> you all are Salesforce experts, so you know the challenge with free text. It's a little bit harder to quantify and it's a little bit harder to scale, but it can be done. So you know, qualitative research can be done. So when you're thinking about the system and you're thinking about this approach, those are some things to consider. The next part in a recipe that I love to use anytime you're making any change in Salesforce and you're trying to think about how to drive adoption out of it is stakeholder mapping. So you want to think about stakeholder mapping because there is more than one type of person who's using your system, right? And when you're thinking about roles and profiles, that may help you to start to think about where do my stakeholders get started, right? So the three basic questions I have on the right-hand side are who's involved? So who's involved in using the system? Who's involved in making the decisions? What is it that they care about? Because your sales user, your operations user, your fulfillment user, they all care about something a little bit different, right? How much influence do they have? So what's their influence on the organization? Is it outsized, you know, based on how they use the system? So when you're thinking about stakeholder mapping and you see that cute little picture that's at the top of the middle of the screen, you want to do this. You want to draw this picture and you don't have to be good at drawing. I can tell you I'm not. If I drew an elephant and I drew a rose, you'd be like, I don't know which one you just drew, Shannon. <laughs> but, you know, let that go aside because you really want to think about who are my users? Who are the people that are interested? You see a lot of executives who say, I want Salesforce to give me this particular data. Are they using it on a daily basis? Probably not, but you know what sort of data they want to get. So they may say, I wanna get these 100 data points. You wanna also start to think about, okay, but what does that mean for the users who are inputting this information? The folks in marketing, the folks in sales, the folks in service, customer success. What are the things that they need? What are the things they're thinking about? And then you wanna sort of map, how do they interact with each other? How do they look? With each other? How do they work with each other's data and information? So you're going to think about that. 
And the most critical point here is that you want to think about the people being at the center. That's the whole idea of human-centered design. That golden triangle of people, process, and technology is so critically hinged on people because you may have the world's best process and the most gorgeous technology that Salesforce could ever produce. But if the people won't use it, it doesn't do any good, right? I could remember being involved with a CPQ implementation. This was early in the days of CPQ, and it was drawn perfectly to a very complex selling organization. It was designed so that the users could click through very easily, but it never went all the way through to the people who were in fulfillment and order fulfillment. They weren't considered from the beginning. And guess what happened to that? It never took off. It was cumbersome and it was complex and it didn't take all of the people who were at the center of it into accord. So when we're thinking about human-centered design, that's really where we're at. So you want to think about how you can balance out that ecosystem. And so there's a quick guide here. Again, if you're the type of person that likes to take pictures or screenshots, this green part in the middle is beautiful. So you want to think about what is our subject area? So, you know, when you're thinking about an implementation and in integration, a brand new uh, way that you are customizing Salesforce, what is the subject area? Think about who the collaborators are. So is finance involved? Is HR involved? Do we have people from inside sales who are involved? And you want to think about who they are and draw the map and think about how they are interacting with each other. So you want to be really thoughtful about that. And if you've got related groupings, like you may say, Inside sales and field sales, they have the same exact approach. They have the same exact way of using Salesforce. So technically, they may be separate in terms of organizationally, but when you're looking at stakeholder mapping, they may be a little bit different. So you can use your company's org chart as a great place to get started, right? So when I'm thinking about these two things, you know, the system usability scale and the stakeholder mapping, and I am trying to build out a recipe, you see in the bottom left of the screen right now, it's showing you here's a sample combination. And they're telling you stakeholder mapping with fly on the wall observation. I suggest, I submit to you that using the system usability scale to first collect quantitative data and then using stakeholder mapping to say, now that I know this information, how can I say who's going to be using it and where can they use it and how can I apply that? And again, this is all about beginning with the end in mind, thinking about the system, how it's going to be used and getting that good information from your users, right? Because beautiful technology is no good if nobody's using it, right? I am just about at the end of my time, so I want to invite you to put a few questions in. We've got a few minutes for questions, and while you're putting that in there, I want to show you um, Luma Institute has a book called Innovating for People. It's available on Kindle, on Amazon. You can get it from there. They also have human-centered design planning cards, which are great because you can use them, and they've got these same little tips that I just taught you about with these two methods to say, hey, if I'm doing one of these particular approaches, if I'm using the rose thorn bud approach, here are the things to think about. And they're great to carry around whenever you're doing design or discovery sessions. This can be all the way back to your initial call when you're saying, tell me a little bit about your problems. Or when somebody says, I hate Salesforce, you may start to use these in a way that say, says, tell me just a little bit more about that, right? So you want to think about those things. Uh, thank you, Jeff Jones. My book is called It's About Time. If you follow me on Twitter and send me a DM with your address, I will put a copy of that book in the mail for you. I've got loads of them sitting here in my office that I would love to get into your hands. So if you'd like a copy, please send it. Yeah, Vanessa, I'll send you one, girl. Um, so please um, make sure you connect with me on um, Twitter and send me your address and I will get them out to you. Um, let me hear uh, any of the questions. So tell me, who's got the first question? Somebody just sent me a private question that says, how do you know when you should use a human-centered design approach? This feels very heavy. You're right, it does feel heavy, but it's not. Because you can use it in a way where you say, let's sit down in a conference room, a virtual conference room, let's get 15 of us on the phone and let's take this really rigorous approach where I act as a facilitator. Or you can use it in a very gentle way. They may not know, right? I'm going to go back to 
this. There's so many different approaches that you could use sensitively and informally. Those of you that are BAs are already doing some of these things and you're asking these questions and people don't even realize what you're doing. You're so good at it. So you may just gently use some of these approaches, right? So you may say, okay, uh, if I were you, how would I answer this question? I hate Salesforce because it gets in my way when blank. And they'll tell you. So you may be just standing in between meetings and asking these questions. So the way that I like to think about it is the bigger the project is, visibility, budget, number of people affected, the more of these approaches you may want to use in a formal way. But if we're talking about adding a new field, if we're talking about adding a new pick list item, do you need to sit down and do all this? No. So I try to tie the human centered design approach to the size of the project and the impact it's going to have on the organization. Right. I am peeking to see if there are any other questions that anybody else has. If you think of any questions where you're like, maybe I'm a little shy to put it in this public chat, you can reach me on Twitter. That is at Shannon J. Gregg. That is where you will find me. I'm happy to answer your questions. I'm constantly thinking about user adoption because unlike the users at the beginning, a little more like Melissa, I love and obsess obsessed with Salesforce. I've been working on it for uh, about 13 years now, and I just know the power that it holds, and I know you do too. So if you've got any questions that you think of, please reach out to me because I would love to help you a little bit more. Think about how you can use human-centered design to drive salesforce.com user adoption. Thanks so much for coming, and I hope you have a magnificent day at Send Cal Dreamin'. Thanks to Bitwise Industries for inviting us all here today.